Hello, I'm Josh um, at Comstock. I am the Compliance and Finance Manager for Comstock. Uh, Matthew is on the road today, so I'll be helping with the webinar today um, with Lori Carter, who is in our one of our Kansas offices, and she is going to be talking about grain and cattle marketing strategies for 2023. Um, Lori, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, good morning. I'm Lori Carter. I'm in the Garden City, Kansas office, which for those of you who don't know, is in the southwestern corner of Kansas, not very far from Colorado or the Oklahoma border. Um, today I'm going to do a just a brief strategy and marketing mainly on grain and cattle because that's what's uh, prevalent in my area of the country. Um, the first thing I have for you is the lovely uh, disclaimer. Um, as most people are probably aware, futures trading does involve risk. Um, the risk can be substantial. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Our trading advice is based on the best information we have from statistical service and other sources, uh, but there's no guarantee that the advice we give will result in profitable trades. There's more to that, but I'll let you, I'll, I'll give a moment that you can read the rest of it yourself. Okay, assuming you're fairly quick readers. The first couple of things I'd like to talk about are just market perspectives and general current underlying issues affecting pretty much all of the commodities we deal with. Hey, Lori, um, I'm going to interrupt you for one second. Um, okay. If anybody has any questions while Lori's talking, they can either put them in the chat or do a question on the Q&A, and uh, we'll either answer them at the end or I'll jump in here and stop where you're like, I just did, and uh, address those questions as we're going. Okay, back to you, Lori, sorry. Okay, before we came on, Josh did mention to me that maybe I should speak loudly. That's something I rarely hear. So if anyone has an issue, let me know, but I usually speak loudly and fast. Um, okay, so the first thing I have here is inflationary pressures. I do believe that interest rate adjustments have calmed some of these. And while we maybe don't see that as much um, at the gas pump or in the store um, as what has happened overall, some examples of that would be crude oil dropping from $130 to 70, natural gas from $10 to about three, gasoline at some point from $3 down to two, though it's climbed back up towards 260. And on that, I'm talking about at the futures market rate. Um, coffee from $2.50 to $1.50, and even corn from $7.60 last spring to $6.50 currently, or $6.50 or so. The next thing, demand concerns. I feel like the rhetoric that we hear has changed from last spring to where there was demand concerns all across the board on everything, and we were going to run out of everything, and inflation uh, was rampant to now we've probably over adjusted in the rhetoric in the opposite direction, maybe a little over hyped. Um, I believe that the, and all of this is my own opinion only, um, that the combination of commodities prices coming down and the dollar also having come down over the last several months um, makes for some upcoming changes in demand and encouraging some demand, especially from outside the country. Uh, the next thing, weather concerns. We all talk about Brazil, South America, Argentina. Um, that's important right now uh, as far as old crop, our old crop grains, um, because it matters mainly there. The rest of the discussion about U.S. weather um, pertains more to what will happen this spring and what will happen with new crop grains. Um, just recently, it looks like some of the weather um, predictions have changed from claiming that we'll continue to have drought everywhere to maybe a little bit different opinion and maybe even a narrowed planting window um, in the spring for for those grains uh, because of actually some wet issues in the Corn Belt areas mainly. Uh, also the real effects of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Last spring, like I just mentioned before, all of the hype um, ran several markets to extreme highs based on the idea that what happened in Russia and Ukraine, basically what I feel like the market did is 
priced in any losses that would happen there um, immediately. So for example, Kansas City wheat, which is what we deal with in Kansas. So that's what I'll be talking about here, hard red winter wheat, 1350. Now it's 850, basically where it was before that all started. Um, natural gas to $10. Now it's back lower than before all that started. I feel like now we have overdone some of those markets and that we will actually see the real effects of um, maybe less grain coming out of that area um, eventually in a, in a more drawn out affair than what the market was trying to price in last spring. Um, outside market influences, black swan, white swan events, I think we just actually talked about one. Um, economic disruption, we hear continual talk about recession, about problems uh, all across the economy. Um, so those are always outside factors that can then spill over and affect the grain. Um, the energy market is a big one that can because of all the relationships between gasoline, ethanol, biofuel, all of that. So those are also things that um, I feel like we have to keep in perspective when anytime we're dealing with the grain markets as well. Um, this first chart, the charts that I have are also just for perspective to give some kind of an idea where we are at price-wise compared to short-term history and long-term history. This is a Kansas City wheat, hard red winter wheat monthly chart, somewhere around the 850 area. And if you look, you can see that's basically where we both were on, the, on that market before the Russia-Ukraine um, stuff happened. While this is um, a good time to do a marketing outlook conference, I'm going to just say this up front. I don't necessarily feel that this is exactly the right time to um, be doing any risk, most risk management. It's seasonally not the time, price-wise not the time in my opinion. So any of the strategies that I'm doing here are somewhat hypothetical maybe using a current price. And you'll also notice that any of the strategies that I've outlined here are to help um, set a floor and yet leave some room on the upside because I think that potential exists. There's a few outliers on a couple of commodities and I'll mention those when they come up. So this first strategy would be to new crop Kansas City wheat. If you sold the July futures at around 840, you could reopen the upside with a bull call spread something like buying a July 820 call, selling a $9 call. If that costs you 22 cents and you see there's 80 cents possibility in between the two strike prices, you could add 60 cents or so to your price. So putting that around $9, um, you could additionally sell a $7 put um, at 16 and a half cents, get that down to very little cost. There is some downside risk there. So that would be a more aggressive um, strategy to do. Um, at the bottom of the page, you see you could use September. And that's because July options um, time-wise don't cover everyone's harvest window. So if you need more time, you could do a similar strategy using September. The second strategy would be to protect the downside with a put call window or sometimes called a fence. If you bought a September, again, we're using September because of expiration dates, buying a September 860 put, selling a 1060 call, you could protect the floor of slightly above $8 and you've still got room on the upside up to 1060. Um, so that looks attractive as far as protecting the downside, giving yourself $2 of room on the upside. This is just a suggestion, a multi-year sale. This wouldn't always be advisable, and I'm not sure that it is. I just know that it's unusual to be able to go another year out and price something close to where the forward contract is trading, and keeping in mind that until last year, the highest price that July had gone off the board at harvest time was 844. In 2022, that was 867. Um, options are thin out that far. But you, if you could do a similar option window, you could put that in place um, in July 24, also allowing for some room to the upside. This is a monthly corn chart. Same thing, actually, for perspective <clears throat> on where we sit price-wise compared to short-term, long-term history. 
Um, if you look at that, you'll see that where we're not at the high, um, we're not terribly off the, the high, probably third of where the market's traded historically. Monthly soybean chart, kind of same thing. Um, near the, nearer the top end of a long-term uh, chart, obviously high short-term, um, not at all at a bad level to consider doing something and yet not at an extreme high level where we got last spring either. This strategy would be an old crop corn pricing strategy. Um, if you're still holding some old crop corn, um, in our area, for those of you who don't know, we've had an extremely positive basis. So, and that has encouraged selling of old crop. So I'm not sure there's, um, I'm not sure there's a lot of that left to do around here, but if someone chose to hold the cash and delay pricing it, you could protect your downside also with a put call window something like buying a 660 July put, selling a 720 call, therefore um, giving yourself a floor price, but allowing for 60 cents upside move as well. Um, the second, also a similar strategy, you would sell the old crop corn, which in this case would take advantage of a, a better than average uh, basis in our area. <laughs> Uh, replace the corn with a bull call spread, something like buying a July 660 call, selling a July 760 call. If you spent 24 cents or so, you could add 75 cents to your price if the market moved higher and, and you would reward uh, that and still taking advantage of that basis. On the new crop corn, again, hypothetical um, not really the time of year that I would be pushing anyone to hedge some new crop corn. Um, if you did, out of concerns that you you need this break-even price, um, you could sell the December futures around $6, open that top side up with a bull call spread, like buying a $6 call, selling a $6.60 call, um, adding 40 cents or so to your price. Additionally, you could sell something like a 520 put, which would put the, the whole combination costing you nothing and maybe add 60 cents to the price um, if that would happen. New crop corn, similar strategy to what we talked about before. This would be a put call window. Um, an example, buying a 590 put, selling a 690 call, um, cost of about 27 cents and you would net 73 cents um, there. You'd protect um, for, uh, excuse me, you'd protect it and while leaving about a 70 some cents upside potential. New crop soybeans, again, the price isn't exactly here. Um, if you could sell November futures around $14, you could spend about 31 cents to reopen the upside with a bull call spread as well. Something like a 14, buying a $14 call, selling a $15 call for a net cost of 31, adding 70 cents or so to your price if that should happen. Um, next, I'd like to talk a little bit about cattle. Um, uh, just a couple of comments. Cattle on feed numbers have peaked and are heading lower for the foreseeable future. Um, the inventory is projected to be 89, about 89 and a half million head, down 91 point from 91.9 million a year ago. Um, that report comes out at the at the end of the month. Uh, we'll know more for sure, but that's what the that's what the um, informed ex experts expect. A combination of that supply decline and seasonal demand improvement should be supportive. Uh, premiums though, in both the live cattle and especially in the feeder cattle offer opportunities for price protection. Option strategies that allow for some capture of additional value are recommended. Uh, big premiums, especially in deferred feeder cattle futures. If you haven't noticed or looked, you will see that August to November feeder cattle are about a $20 premium or more over the forward contract. So some um, probably more uh, than usual opportunities offered there. That would be one of the outliers where I would be 
um, more aggressive in getting some protection than several of these other markets. Um, on another note, economic disruption and or recession may be limiting factors for, factors for price improvement, mainly due to beef demand and, and the cost of beef when people's incomes are um, stressed. Here's a monthly live cattle chart, also for perspective, not too far off of all time highs. There are a lot of the um, experts there in that market who believe we'll make all time new highs um, just based on sheer lack of numbers. That uh, decrease in numbers has been accentuated by the drought moving uh, cattle into feed yards ahead of schedule, lighter than usual, all of the above because there simply was no other choice. Um, reducing breeding herds. So then we, we, it's just, it's a cycle that repeats and takes um, um, quite some time to work its way out. Monthly feeder cattle, this, mark, this price doesn't look real high compared to history. But if you look at um, where the, the back months I mentioned before are trading, they are closer up to those, those all time high levels so some protection there looks uh, particularly attractive to me. A couple of strategies similar to what we did before or looked at before on the grains, um, a put call window or a fence, buying an April live cattle 160 put, selling a 165 call for about $2, um, locks in a floor and leave yourself some room on the top. I did notice that I thought the April live cattle puts were um, inexpensive enough to maybe justify just buying one on its own and leaving the top side open. Um, another example in August is similar, 156 put, 166 call. Uh, for 285, that actually gives you a $10 price window. So lots of room on the upside. Here's an example on the August feeders of what I just mentioned, actually buying a 204 put at 715, selling a 214 call at 340 for a net cost of 375. Um, that leaves, again, $10 upside above a $200 or $2 floor. Looks particularly attractive to me. Um, I just want to mention that uh, we also, too, uh, at Comstock, uh, do quite a bit of spec trades. Most of the spec customers that I have started out as my farming or hedge customers and um, enjoy doing some spec trading as well. We do have a subscription to More Research, which has seasonal trades um, that have worked consistently at least 80% of the time. That information is it anybody's advice. It's simply historical seasonal things and it's statistical. Um, so we use that a lot. Uh, that's available. Um, I use the research and share it often, and I'm willing to do that with anyone who'd like to participate in some of those trades. Um, I always, at the end of my daily tier, put uh, down commodities that appear too cheap to me. And it's interesting that um, several of them keep showing up. And on this year's list, I have natural gas, which, like I mentioned, is at around $3 after trading at 10 Platinum, which is still just at a, even though it's moved higher over the last several years, at a pretty big discount to both gold and palladium, its competitor and catalytic converters. Um, and in the past, uh, not too many years ago, traded at a premium to those. Coffee, which has moved down dramatically, and I don't feel um, any less in demand for the coffee myself. So just a couple of things I think are too cheap. Some of those in the meantime have been extreme high and then have come back to too low levels, in my opinion. Some energy spreads that we have traded this year um, that have done well and made quite a bit of money for spec customers. An example of those are currently natural gas to crude oil. At the moment, the spread between those, the value, dollar value of one contract of each is around $50,000. That's moved probably $35,000 in that direction in the last several months. The gasoline to diesel spread is another. Um, prior to 2022, gasoline and diesel, the widest they usually 
spread got apart was about 60 cents. Um, we're currently around that level. We've been out to over a dollar apart. Um, a couple of other spec ideas this year, we did some, and, and I'll be looking for these opportunities again. Um, if for anybody who's interested in writing or selling options, we sold some extremely high natural gas calls, $18, $21, some $30 gasoline calls uh, for exceptional value. And since the market is now, those were basically February options, markets at $3, you can see that all of those expire worthless. So the, the premiums were kept. Um, those Kansas City wheat also offered that opportunity since it traded to $13.50. Uh, customers could write or sell $15 calls, $13 calls, and keep all those option premiums. So just um, other things I'm always looking out for, things that um, are at extreme levels and option values at extreme levels. Um, so that's all I have. If anyone would like to call, you can speak with me or any of the other brokers at Comstock. All marketing plans for anything you do, I feel like should be personalized for you, for your operation, and for um, your preference. My office number is 712-227-1171. My cell phone number is 620-287-4018. Um, anybody have any questions or any comments? I don't see any right now, Lori. So <clears throat> let's wait a minute. Um, anything else you'd like to touch on that you didn't cover in there that you thought of while you were talking? Um, no, I don't think so. I could okay. go you, on. You covered a lot of information. So, that. huh? You covered a lot of really good information. So, um, okay. it lo looks like that's about it. So. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Lori, for taking time out and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, I will be sending out the recording of this later on um, this afternoon. And if you have any questions, again, feel free to call Lori at any time or call into the office and we will be more than willing to help you guys. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, everyone.